Yeah, and uh, after we do refuge in bodhicitta, then we will try to do clarity of mind meditation. Okay, so we'll go straight into it and just see what happens. Okay, and so just try and stay with me as I uh, describe the different stages. Okay, starting with refuge. Sange Chudan Sogi Chunam Hai Jancho Badu Dani Gabsu Chi Dagi Jin Sogi Besonam Kia Drola Penji Sange Drupa Sho Sange Chudan Sogi Chunam Hai Jancho Badu Dani Gabsu Chi Dagi Jin Sogi Besonam Ki Drola Penji Sange Drupa and allow your mind to mix with that motivation, adjusting it into your own words if you need. And now for a few minutes, simply observe the sensation of your breath <coughs> and choose if you will focus above your upper lip at your nose where the air comes and goes or if you'd rather focus at the abdomen where the stomach rises and falls. So choose one place to focus your attention. And it's perfectly normal for physical sensations or thoughts to distract you. Just make the choice not to follow those distractions, but return your attention to the breath. And thoughts are no big deal. Just try not to get lost in them. Come back to the breath.
Try to create a balanced focus that's neither too tight nor too loose. And gradually move your focus away from the breath to observing the thoughts, watching thoughts, emotions, sensations, feelings, labels, all the different movement within the mind, just observing it without engagement or suppression. As you watch your own thoughts, some of them you will want to follow, some of them you will want to push away. Just decide to rest in the middle, allowing them to arise and dissolve naturally without any added energy towards them. Come back to watching. And gradually move your focus away from the thoughts to the spacious, clear consciousness. Broad and vast like the sky. The thoughts continue to come and go, but your focus is not emphasized there, turning towards the clarity of the mind.
And keeping your mind very spacious, but not spacing or spacing out. This is not a vague drifting, rather a bright clarity. and dedicate the positive mental energy of this focus to developing your fullest potential for the benefit of all living beings. So you can relax your attention. Comments or questions? Hmm? Yeah. So you have one question when you said on uh, any session when you have to know what to do when you enter your meditation, you mind to attack meditation, but are we going to do you need to know very specifically, yeah. What what are, what are you doing? What is the purpose? What is the structure? You know, what's uh, you know what is the conclusion you want to come to? You know, be very clear about the whole thing. Um, which is why guided meditation is nice, right? Because you don't have to be that organized, right? You can just be like, play, <laughs> right? Um, but if you're leading yourself, you have more ownership over the process. You have more depth and connection because you're pacing yourself at your speed, not the speed of the meditation leader. So the speed of the meditation leader is never going to be perfect for everyone in the room at the same time. So the way to treat guided meditation is if you can touch something experientially, that's fantastic. But better is probably to just get very used to the structure so you can do it yourself. Yeah? So it's a good way to like learn the process so you can take it home with you. But if you do meditation, can you switch between the, uh, the yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's it's basically not. <coughs> what you don't want to do is let your mind just randomly choose types that it likes spontaneously with no organization. Say you know, say you know five different kinds of meditation, and you start out with breathing, and you randomly bounce between styles. That's what you don't want. But if in a structured way you're consciously moving, like in this one, you're moving from first motivation. Right? We did refuge in bodhicitta. Then we're focusing on the breath, al allowing conceptual thoughts to slowly settle down, become less full on. Then we're moving to observation of the thoughts, watching them, seeing what they do, not, tr not following them, not pushing them, just watching. And then we move to observation of the bare consciousness itself, trying to stay with the spacious clarity of that. And then we, um, and you're watching that without suppression or engagement as well, and then dedicate. Right? So it was a sequence, it was a structured sequence, but there was different things and emphasized at different stages. But you know, you knew it ahead of time, or I knew it ahead of time. Um, I walked you through it. Yeah. I'm a little bit perplexed. I started with, with concentrating with the breath. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it, so I, okay, I know what, I, what are the obstacles, what are the difficulties. I'm going to 
So this way I went with you, mm -hmm. and then you said something to loosen, as, as I understood this, to loosen it and to go observe the thought. Mm -hmm. This thing, I don't know, so I drifted, mm -hmm. I lost it. I mean, it's easier for me personally to, I know what is the breath to concentrate, mm -hmm. but this mixing, I don't know what happened. I mean, I... Because it's the first time, yeah? It's the first yeah, time. Yeah, so of course. Why do I need to do the two things? You don't. You can do whatever you like, but um, but the reason for observing the thoughts there are many way there are many benefits to being able to do that type of meditation. Okay, so one of them is just the bare fact that we normally believe what we say to ourselves. Yeah, most of the time we believe what we say in in our internal dialogue, right? Right, and so if you watch it, you can kind of say. Actually, that one's not so good, <laughs> right? In the meditation, you're not doing that categorization process. You're more just noticing that there is choice. Why yeah. do you combine it with the concentration? Why do you, why do you want to do it separately as, as, a, as, a, as a meditation only mm -hmm. on observing? You can, you can. Um, meditation on the breath can be used as its own meditation, but it's also often used as a preliminary to all other meditations. Okay, so it sounds like you've been using it as your main meditation, which is perfectly fine and really good and useful. Um, but you can also use like a snapshot of that, just a short version of that, to get you settled enough to do everything else. So breathing meditation in Tibetan Buddhism is often used as a preliminary. Preliminary for beginners or preliminary for meditation after a month or two to do the combined thing? A preliminary to anybody, it's just some days you need it and some days you don't, yes. right? Like if you've had a busy day at work and you're all spinny, mm -hmm. if you just start to try and meditate, sometimes you're just a bit too distracted. Mm -hmm. So it helps to just ground yourself. Mm -hmm. But if you've had a nice quiet day at home and you're just chill, you know, you might not need it. So it's so a it's, choice. It's a choice. To do the Sunday this way, Monday exactly. Yeah, exactly. So you might have the main thing you're emphasizing in your process, but the way that you frame it might be slightly different day to day, depending on what you need. Yeah, and that's just your own choice, you know, what makes sense. Yeah. Um, other thoughts or questions? Could you do it by yourself at home? Just gently move through those stages? No. Yes and no's, <laughs> both. Um, I was, uh, I was showing Ofra, there's an app, right, on your iPad called Insight Timer that will bong at you, you know, every five minutes if you want it to. So if you have trouble self-structuring, sometimes it helps to set a timer, whether you use a fancy app on your phone or your iPad or whether you just like set the egg timer on your oven or whatever, right? Sometimes it helps uh, if you want to self-guide, but you know that your mind is too crazy to set a timer just to kind of, oh, shift sages, you know, shift. Is there a structured way to look on your thoughts? Because this is not clear to me, I don't know, everybody understands me, but I don't think I understand. How to watch your thoughts? Yeah, this is, seems to, to you so natural that we understand, but I don't understand. Yeah, no, it's just because it's new. Um, there's, you, have no de you, you have no deficit, <laughs> right? It's just new. Um, so uh, a good way to start, okay, a good way to start. Maybe a good way to start is to think of the times that you're having thoughts on purpose as opposed to when you're just having thoughts naturally without effort that distinction. Okay, so when you're having thoughts on purpose like making your grocery list, like what do I need, what do I need, uh, eggs, you know, that. Okay, when you're having that sort of process, do you notice that there's more than one thing happening? There's your listing process, and then there's the part of your mind that is watching the listing process and trying to stay focused with it. Yeah, there's two sort of separate mental factors operating. And, and that's why we did mind and its potential first, is to understand all the different pieces of the mind and how they're all working. So you know, you can look at YouTube if you want to look, right? Because um, our brilliant technicians have it up online. Um, so, um, but you know, so what you're noticing is that there's multiple things happening in your mind at any given time, and sometimes you impose control and sometimes you don't. But to notice that you have the ability to do so, then you can bring it to the meditation. So if you think of that part of your mind, which is like introspection, that you are really engaged with when you're forming thoughts on purpose, now try and use that without the forming thoughts on purpose and use it just to watch the ones that come by themselves. And what will happen is that 
for some people, their thoughts are so either so slow or so fast that it's a blur. That there's no, you can't even hear the words specifically one by one. It's just kind of like, uh, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> Right, you know, right. That's the thought. Is I don't know, whatever, um, or like a hum <laughs> or static, right? Um, or some people are thinking, what am I doing? What am I supposed to be doing? I should be doing this. Okay, what am I doing? The breath, the breath, the breath was happening. Okay. Oh my God, my sister-in-law is coming for dinner. Oh my God, you know. Some people have really obvious words in their thoughts. Some people don't. And some people have obvious words in their thoughts, and some people don't, depending on day as well. Like we have hazy days and we have sharp, clear days. So it doesn't matter what the contents of the thought are. What you're trying to notice is that there's a difference between the movement in the mind and that which is stable in the mind. So sometimes the thoughts are words. Sometimes it's more the con conceptual feelings, you know, just a generally unpleasant or generally pleasant, generally neutral. You know, sometimes it's um, a picture in the mind or a memory or a song. You know, so it's not just watch the thoughts as only thoughts in words. You know, we're watching all conception. And um, so whether they're words or not doesn't matter. You don't have to like manufacture thoughts to look at if they're not coming naturally. What you're trying to do is create that observational stance that just is noticing movement. Yeah, noticing movement within the mind. And it just takes a bit of practice. Yeah, and it takes a bit of like thinking. And you know, you, you can see yourself reading. You know, sometimes when you're reading, you've like fallen into the text and you're completely absorbed and a bomb could go off, you wouldn't even notice, except for you're in Israel, so you would, but generally, um, right? But then there's times you're reading where you could even be listening to music at the same time and reading and sort of half aware of both, you know? And so what we're noticing is that the mind has many different abilities and can do many different things. And now we're trying to choose ones to impose control over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so notice that there's a difference between reading a book with music on and reading a book completely absorbed. And to notice that in the music listening version, there is some distance between what's going on in your mind and your engagement with it. Yeah. So similarly with these types of meditation, it's um, your level of engagement is what's slightly different. Yeah. So I'm um, so I don't know if that helps you kind of like touch what I'm talking about, and and just keep experimenting, see what happens. But you know, once you've been kind of watching the movement in the mind for a while, then you stop caring about the movement of the mind, and you want to watch the stability of the mind and the spaciousness and the clarity that is always there, kind of like behind the movement. Um, the movement still happens, but it's no longer your focus. Yeah, and so you're not distressed that there's still thoughts happening. It's just they're not your focus anymore. You want to observe, observe. Mm, very nice. Is this the difference between thinking of thought mm -hmm. and firing it? Maybe, yeah. Maybe something like that. Yeah. Yeah, and you have to sort of play with it in your own head because all of us work a little bit differently. There's some things that are common for everyone, but then there's the individual experience that just you have to play with. Yeah. So, so don't be worried if, if it's not obvious right away. It's new, you know. It's new. For me, yeah. for me it was like very easy, mm -hmm. yes, it was, I, I was like a bird looking down mm. to my thoughts, yeah. really. But when you said uh, choose or pick one um, experience and eliminate a, a, an unpleasant one, yes, something like that said? Did I say that? Yeah. Anyway, proceed, yeah. yeah. What's your thought? No. <laughs> okay, so, um, okay, but it was something that it was like disturbing. Mm. Like, oh, yeah, whether it's yeah. unpleasant or pleasant or neutral doesn't matter, yeah. 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 Well, okay. Um, I mean, part of it is just noticing that our reactions have choice, right? So you can have unpleasant and it doesn't have to mean anything, right? Like, we decide that it means something, you know? I feel uncomfortable, therefore I'm unhappy, therefore I'm going to act out of anger, therefore everyone better get out of my way, therefore people better not be offended if I speak to them harshly, because I'm uncomfortable, right? Like, that whole train doesn't need to happen. You could just be like, I'm kind of uncomfortable. Anyway, right? Like, it could just kind of start and end there, right? But we're so used to attributing meaning and going on with the whole story, right? 
Or you could think, oh, feeling quite pleasant. Oh, this is so pleasant, this relaxing and focusing, and oh, so pleasant. Mm. You know, and you know, then you're going to get lost in it. And then if you don't have that experience next time, you think something's wrong, and all well, these, like a whole thing happens, right? So what if you could just notice? Yeah? Not disassociate, right? But notice and go, that's happening. Oh, something else is happening. Yeah. You know, you're creating some choice. There already was choice, but now you're really taking ownership of it. You know, and um, you can prevent negative emotions before they arise because you're de-escalating while it's still small enough to control. Yeah. But when you think about this is what is happening, and you put the label on mm. your thinking, yeah. And even when you look into your situationist face and you are noticing that that's what you're doing. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And you don't want to get lost in that process. It's just interesting. You go, huh, but come back to observational stance, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't understand exactly the need of taking ownership of it and uh, what's the difference between that and clinging to it. And what I mean is just control. Yeah, control. There was control, but we forgot. So when I say taking ownership, I mean taking back control. Yeah, with the background awareness that the amount of control we can oppose is going to be very <coughs> variable, you know, and will change each day and each moment, and is dependent on conditions. But you know, how much something affects us um, is a lot more up to us than we give ourselves credit for, yes. you know, like that. Yeah. So observation can have many meanings. Mm. Mm -hmm. What is observation? Exactly. Exactly. Observation, yeah, it can have many, many meanings, um, and you know, and that's why I say there's you know different ways to observe. One of them is observing, just observing. Sometimes you're observing with the agenda to notice something. You know, there's many types. You know, um, and all of them have a specific function and are really um, useful. But if we can just kind of like realize that all meditations have one thing in common, which is that there is a focal object and you need to come back to it, right? There's a focal object, whether it's a moving focal object, a structured focal object, a single visual focal object in, with the internal mind, whatever the object is, you're trying to focus on it, your mind will resist, and you have to come back, right? The mind will say, I don't want to focus anymore, I'm bored. Hmm. You know? And you'll say, no, no, it's okay, come back, it'll help. And you go, okay, fine. What's that? Come back. Right? You know, this is what the mind does, right? Like, you know, you're like, yeah, I'm game, all right, let's do this. And you're focused, and it's fine, and then, you know, something will occur to you, and we're used to just pinging around, and we're trying to discipline ourselves and contain it, and that will make us have better concentration and better focus and better memory and more happiness. Um, what's interesting is that a focused mind is often very content. Yeah, if you're focused, not with tightness, you know, not like in a stressful focused way, but like in a proper meditative focused way, that comes with it actually a really nice peaceful feeling a lot of the time. And so it's, it's kind of nice to remind yourself that actually my mind is happier when it's focused. Um, but the balance is tricky. The reason for that is in our life we associate focus with stress. Yeah, and we associate relaxation with sleep. Right? And what we're trying to he do here is break the associations and reassociate in a different way that focus could go together with relaxation. Yeah? Do you know what I mean? So, you know, so we are focused in our lives sometimes, but often when we're focused, it has an element of stress with it. Right? And we are relaxed sometimes in our life, but it has an aspect of dullness or sleepiness with it. And actually, we could be focused and relaxed. Yeah. It just, It helps, yeah. Helps you be more friendly, yeah. Yeah. Happiness uh, can prevent your neediness, right? Or discontent. Neediness and discontent and thinking, uh, I need this in order to be more content. I'm going to take someone else's country and possessions. You know, you might think, oh, what I have is enough. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> do with that information what you will, right? But, you know, I mean, even just think of how we are in this space, you know? Like, if you're feeling quite happy and content, the amount of space you occupy is enough. 
And if you're feeling discontent, you might have a subtle, grumpy feeling towards the people on either side of you, still being very polite, because you're nice people, but kind of be like, you know? And it's like, it's not really about the space, is it? It's about your mental attitude. So uh, happiness leads to better behavior, right? Um, not excitement, we're not talking excited happy, we're talking about like contentment, yeah? Not like bouncy, bouncy, you know? It, contentment, happiness. Yeah, so happiness helps. Yeah, and it is more actually our natural state. We're just used to agitating the mind and losing it. So if you stop agitating the mind, it goes back to peace. Yeah, so a lot of what we're doing here with these different focal objects is allowing the mind to settle back down. Yeah, and it settles back into peace and it's like, ah, oh, you know, it's a relief. So then we'll, um, shall we experiment with another one, see how it goes? Okay, so this one is uh, slightly more work, um, perhaps slightly more fun, who can say? Um, this is a version of tantric meditation, um, but without the fully qualified all the bits, but still using visualization, still using <laughs> mantra. Um, and it's, uh, you know, this is, it's got religious connotations, so if you want to adjust mentally to something that is not triggering, by all means, I don't know what's going on in your minds, you know, um, make a big smiley face. When I say Shakyamuni Buddha, you can make a big smiley face, or a happy flower, <laughs> or something like that, yeah. So, um, what we're going to do is, Shakyamuni Buddha, y'all know what he looks like, right? He's just here, represented. Um, we set our motivation, then we're going to build up the visualization. I'll walk you through it. Um, then we're going to do the seven limbs. And the seven limbs are another way of stabilizing the mind and getting it into a receptive space to focus, um, as well as accumulating positive mental momentum and getting rid of negativity. So the seven limbs are very cool and are a whole other conversation. So don't get lost in a whole other list. It'll come later, but just to kind of plant the seeds, OK? Um, <laughs> bits, seven bits. Okay, and then um, we'll add the mantra um, and amplify the visualization to a more moving visualization. Then we're going to do an absorption and we're going to dedicate. So you don't need to know any of this, it's just laid out for afterwards so you'll know what just happened. I'll walk you through it, you don't have to look at it. Um, everyone always asks, what does the mantra mean? This is what the mantra means. Okay, so the mantra we're doing is the mantra of Shakyamuni Buddha, who is kind of like the Buddha of ethics. He was the historical Buddha that revealed the Dharma this round. Um, you know, there are many, many Buddhas, but Shakyamuni Buddha is our guy. Okay. Tayata Om Muni Muni Mahamune Soha. Okay? It means it is thus. Um, the enlightened body, speech, and mind, that's Om. The first Muni is control over the suffering of the three lower realms and wrong conceptions. The next Muni is control over all of samsara and the self cherishing thought. Mahamune, great control over subtle obscurations and dualistic minds. Soha means may my mind receive and absorb the meaning of this mantra, keep the essence, may it take root. So basically, may I get enlightened, okay? May it be, may, yeah, enlightenment, enlightenment. Yeah, so the enlightenment, what is out there, the enlightenment which is growing in here, may that all happen. Okay, ready? And um, so there'll be a bit of chanting, um, a bit of visualizing, and just, you know, go with the flow. And if it's all too much, just go to your happy place. I don't know what's going on in you, okay? So, yeah. All right, so, um, so just take a minute and uh, bring your focus to the breath, just for a few breaths to steady the mind. It might help to count the breaths, if that helps you focus. And then bring your motivation back to the mind. Try to think something like, the purpose of my life is to free all living beings from suffering and to bring them the perfect happiness of enlightenment. 
In order to do that, I must become enlightened, therefore engaging the stages of the path and the Shakyamuni Buddha meditation, but framing that in your own way that makes sense to you, something broad and altruistic. And now visualize in the space in front of you, an arm span in front, is a large square jeweled throne supported by eight snow lions, two at each corner. On top of this is a broad variegated lotus multicolored and radiant. On top of this is a sun disk, flat like a cushion. On top of that is a moon disk, the lotus, sun, and moon, represent the three principal aspects of the path. Seated on top of the lotus, sun, and moon is Shakyamuni Buddha, who is golden in color, has one face and two arms. His hair is tied up in a top knot with a crown pinnacle. His right hand is touching the earth, aware of the suffering of all sentient beings. His left hand holds a bowl of wisdom nectar. He wears the robes of a monastic, has long ears, half open eyes, and is smiling directly at you and simultaneously at every single living being. So whether the visualization is clear or foggy, have the impression of the representative of the enlightened mind is here. And try to hold your mind on that representation however is comfortable for you. <clears throat> and imagine that you say to this representative of the enlightened mind, reverently I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind, both to my own potential and that enlightenment which has been actualized in others. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined, all the beautiful things I expose all my negative actions and habits before this compassionate mind and before myself. And I rejoice in all of my positive qualities and the positive qualities of others.
and imagine that you say, please remain until the end of cyclic existence. Please turn the wheel of Dharma for sentient beings. My own merit and those of all others, may they go towards the great enlightenment. And having connected in this way, rays of golden light come from the heart of Shakyamuni Buddha. They curve in an arc to the crown of my head. And golden light flows through me, ripening my own positive potential. Imagine rays of golden light, like the sun, filling you up. And now add the mantra to the visualization of golden light together seven times. to let the mantra resonate within you silently, together with the visualization of golden light. And imagine you've become completely filled up and Shakyamuni Buddha now comes to the crown of your head facing the same direction as you. And he dissolves into light and dissolves into you. And imagine that your mind becomes mixed with the enlightened mind. And now from your own heart, rays of light go out in every direction. At the tip of each ray of light is a tiny Buddha. And these Buddhas go to the crowns of the heads of every single living being.
and light streams down through the crowns of every sentient being, purifying and blessing their minds, bringing them peace. And holding this concept and this visualization as best as you can, adding the mantra once again. internally, sending out rays of light. All of the miniature Buddhas dissolve into the crowns of every single sentient being. And imagine that they too dissolve into light. And all of that light gathers back and dissolves into your heart. and dedicate the merit of this meditation to developing our and perfecting our potential in order to lead every single sentient being to that state of lasting happiness. So um, that's a similar format to what happens in Tantra, although in Tantra it's more complex. Um, but uh, you know, it's just a very common daily practice for people who identify as Buddhist. Sort of before they um, get into Tantra, they do this as a way of connecting with the whole path, as well as developing concentration, reminding themselves of what they believe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so you know, take it or leave it. But um, I can send uh, the outline of it and um, how to say the mantra um, to Shuki, and you can forward it to everybody if you're interested. Then you can take it or leave it. Um, and, um, and I'll have some outlines for you guys tomorrow about different ways to do analysis and different ways to do single-pointed meditation. And then there have been a few questions about what does this word mindfulness mean? Because it obviously means different things in different contexts. And so I'll do a bit of a clarification of that and um, teach you a few more different kinds of meditation. 
so that's what's happening tomorrow. Um, and also, if you've had uh, questions about meditation brewing, try and get them nice and tidy and clear and uh, so you can ask. And your homework is to do five minutes of meditation sometime today, okay? Mm -hmm. And just do five minutes and you can choose either just watching the breath or trying to connect with the clarity of the mind or Shakyamuni Buddha. But, so minimum five minutes. Try and do it yourself because um, it will help you clarify your questions, yeah? Is that okay? Okay, so um, now we'll do some dedications. <clears throat> so in your um, prayer book, at the, towards the end, um, after refuge in Bodhicitta, um, there's one that says brief dedication. So we'll do the first one in English and the uh, second two in Tibetan says a brief dedication at the top. I dedicate whatever virtues I have ever collected for the benefit of the teachings and of sentient beings, and in particular for the essential teachings of Venerable Lozang Drapa to shine forever. Jan chua sem chorim po she am ha ke pan am ke gyo chi ke pan yam pa me pa yang go ne go ndu pa wa sho ke wa di an yu do da la ma sang e dro gyo ne a dro wa jing ga ma lu pa de san a gu pa sho and go ahead and turn the page to the short long life prayer for His Holiness. Kariya rawe koe jingkam dia ben dong de wa ma lu jung we de jen re zi wan ten zi ya su yi cha pe si te ba du ten gyu ji Savior of the Snowland teachings and transmigratory beings who extensively clarify the path that unifies emptiness and compassion. To the lotus in hand, Lord Tenzin Gatso, I beseech, may all your holy wishes be fulfilled. <laughs> Okay, thanks everybody. Have a nice rest of your day. Shabbat shalom. <laughs>